North Africa, 1942, Rommel. The Desert Fox. From Brindisi, we flew to Crete, the island on which our paratroops had descended the year before, among them Max Schmeling, the idol of German boxing. We relished the warmth of spring. Then, on the morning of 8th of April 1942, we took off for North Africa in our Junkers 52, known affectionately as Auntie Jew. I was allowed to sit in the cockpit. We have to fly low over the sea, the pilot told me. In spite of our air superiority, there are always a few spitfires or hurricanes buzzing about the Mediterranean. They come from Malta, which for some reason, quite beyond me, has not been attacked and occupied by now. At that moment, I was not thinking of the war or of what might lie in store for me. I was too taken up with the idea of getting to know a new continent. Suddenly, the machine was pulled higher. We were lucky, laughed the pilot. We shall soon be landing in Dema. The outlines of Africa emerged before us. The narrow coastal strip cultivated by the Italians, with its date palms, olive groves, the whitewashed houses of the colonists, and the long asphalt ribbon of the Via Balbia. Behind it shimmered the desert. That's the stony desert, the pilot informed me, about 200 to 300 kilometres deep before the start of the Sahara proper, with its huge white dunes. These level plains, broken frequently by rocks and hills of gravel, have been the scene of the fighting for the past year or so. I had read books about the desert and the Bedouins, those nomadic people who, for more than 2,500 years, had wandered across the deserts of Arabia and Libya, living according to their own laws and with no form of state. Already I thought I could feel something of the longing that is said to strike all who once set foot in the desert. I hoped I would find time to savour this new environment and its people. Leaving a huge cloud of dust behind her, Auntie Jew landed gently on the sandy runway. The midday heat took us aback even at that time of year. What a contrast to the icy snowstorms of Russia. I'm Lance Corporal Manthe, a man in a faded uniform introduced himself. Major von Luck, I presume. His pure Berlin accent was music in my ears and took me back to my years in Potsdam. I've come to pick you up. They're expecting you. Beck and I felt like greenhorns in our new brown tropical outfits. We stowed our gear. Thanks for collecting us, Manthe. But what do we want with our thick coats in this heat? You'll need them all right. It's bloody cold at night. I'll get you something Italian as uniform. They know what's practical down here. The windshield of the jeep was folded flat and covered over to prevent reflections from the sun. I'm to take you to Rommel first, before we go to division and our battalion. Everyone there spoke only of Rommel, not of the general. So popular was he with his men. He was one of them. During the journey, Manthe told us of the battles of the past year, as he had experienced them. He spoke of the father of the reconnaissance battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Freiherr von Wechmar, his popularity, his successes, and of how proud von Wechmar was to have been the first to land on African soil in 1941. Our battalion is the apple of Rommel's eye, he added proudly. It occurred to me that I wasn't going to find things easy. We left Dema in an easterly direction. Rommel's HQ must lie somewhere among the olive groves. One of us must look out for aircraft. They usually come from behind. Beck took this on. Suddenly we turned off the road. No path, no track was to be seen. Tire marks were always removed at once as camouflage. Suddenly we stopped. Rommel is. HQ. All the vehicles were well dispersed and camouflaged. In the middle stood a monster of a truck. That's the mammoth. We took it from the British and converted it into Rommel's command car. I spotted some eight-wheeled scout cars. This was the new fast reconnaissance vehicle, which we hadn't had yet in Russia. I was rather keyed up. After all, I hadn't seen Rommel since the French campaign in 1940. An orderly officer took me to him. He had a deep suntan covering his sharp features, giving him a fully healthy look. He was at the peak of his career, clearly enjoying his worldwide reputation. 
he was in a high mood and clearly glad to see me. I am reporting on transfer to the Africa Corps, Colonel General, I said. Glad you're here, he replied. I've waited long enough. Unfortunately, I've had to send Wekmar to Germany. He became sick. You are taking over my pet battalion. Let it be a credit to you. Then, typically, he came straight to the point. You've come at just the right moment. I'm preparing a new offensive to forestall the British. Your battalion will play an important part in it. My chief of staff, Gauss, will brief you. Then report to your division. How's my old 7th Panzer Division? Was it bad in Russia? I gave him a brief account and was dismissed. General Gauss, Rommel's chief of staff, with whom I would have much to do, gave me a summary of the situation. He then added, Rommel is very disappointed at the indifference of the upper leadership. Hitler and the High Command see North Africa as a secondary theatre of war. For the British, however, it is decisive. In addition, he is exasperated by the slack conduct of the sea war by the Italians. In March, for instance, instead of the requested 60,000 tonnes of materiel, only 18,000 arrived. In Rommel's view, the chance of victory in Africa had already been missed. Despite heavy losses through our U-boat campaign, and despite a 12,000-mile-long sea route, sufficient supplies for the British were getting through to the front. That didn't sound very encouraging. Nevertheless, Rommel seemed to be set on turning the tables, once again in his favour. He hoped to take Tobruk by an unexpected thrust and be able to advance far into Egypt, provided he could forestall the British. I took my leave. Manthe, we've got to go to division now, it was the 21st Panzer Division, and then on to the battalion. Very well, Major. You seem to be well in with Rommel for him to greet you personally, said Manthe. I told him a few things about Rommel. Well, yes, he said. It certainly is unusual to bring someone here from Russia. Our commander von Wechmar was a great guy. His son Rudiger has also been with us now for a couple of weeks as a young lieutenant. That's tradition. You'll be all right, Major. Divisional HQ was well camouflaged under palms and olive trees. General von Bismarck greeted me in friendly fashion. He had been my commander in East Prussia in 1930, at the start of my military career. Like so many who were serving in the desert, he looked emaciated. The pitiless heat by day, the icy cold at night, the sandstorms, the millions of fliss, and the hard battles had left their mark. A hearty welcome to you, luck, we haven't seen each other for twelve years, you re-entering upon a fine inheritance. Weshmar and his battalion have done great things and are Rommel's favourite unit. After your service in Russia, you've got some adapting to do. Familiarise yourself with conditions as quickly as you can. We shall probably be opening a decisive offensive before long. Best of luck. The general staff officer briefed me on the situation. The task of the 3rd Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion was to reconnoitre in the far south, prevent or report any outflanking move by the enemy, and form the spearhead in any attack. The British, meanwhile, have strongly fortified their Gazala position, he continued. There is a vast minefield, with about 500,000 mines stretching from the coast to Birhachim, a waterhole south of Tobruk, originally developed by the Italians. Bir Hachem is held by French troops under General Koenig. Behind this defensive barrier, the British are preparing to go on the offensive as soon as they can bring up enough material. And that, apparently, is what Rommel means to forestall. So we've got to be extremely vigilant to ensure that the British don't attack around the south of Bir Hachem deep in our flank. To look out for that and to prevent it is your job, Locke among other things. We left the green of Cyrenaica for the south. Manthe knew the track. Normally one travelled in the desert only by compass, the most important instrument carried by everyone. Behind us, we raised a huge cloud of dust which engulfed us whenever we had to break abruptly. The desert shimmered. In the far distance, it was often hard to tell whether the shimmering something was a vehicle or merely a camel's thornbush. Suddenly, visible only a few metres in advance, 
we came to a wadi, one of the many dried up watercourses, in which my new battalion was lying, well dispersed. Captain Everth, who had been leading the battalion and a few other officers were there to greet me, correctly, but with a certain reserve as it seemed to me. Von Weckmar, the old man, would be hard to replace. We went to the command car, a converted Opel Blitz truck. As Everth explained to me, all vehicles were fitted with special oil filters against the dust. Many of the trucks had treadless tyres so that they left no distinctive track in the sand. Besides the new eight-wheeled scout cars, I spotted some tracked motorcycles, 750 Satsis BMWs, fitted with two narrow tracks in place of the rear tyres. They had been developed especially for the desert. I asked all the officers to gather together so that I could meet them. Once again, I felt out of place in my new tropical outfit, for all the other officers wore faded uniforms, of which they were very proud, or loose Italian trousers and shirts. Good old man, they organised something similar for me too in the next few days. I know your battalion from pre-war days when I was in Potsdam, I began. There was a healthy rivalry between our two battalions as to which was the better or the more prominent. But we also took part together in a number of rallies. It is an honour for me to succeed your beloved and seasoned commander von Weckmer. I have only my experience from the French campaign and from Russia. I have much to learn here and would be grateful for any help you can give me. I should like to go out on reconnaissance with one of your patrols as soon as possible, to familiarise myself with conditions. I greeted each of the men individually with a handshake. The ice appeared to have been broken. I learned that on the British side, we were usually up against the Royal Dragoons, the 11th Hussars, and the dreaded long-range desert group, led by the legendary Lieutenant Colonel David Stirling. The British used the better armoured but slower Humber scout car, we the faster, nimbler eight-wheeler. Meanwhile, we understood each other. The prevailing atmosphere was one of respect and fair play. I got used to the Fata Morgana, the Mirage, which looked so hopefully like a lake, but which on approach dissolved into nothing. I had also to get accustomed to the ferocious sandstorm, which the Italians called the Ghibli. It usually lasted for a day but sometimes for three. One could see it coming. The sky grew dark. The fine sand penetrated every pore and made any movement, let alone any military operation, impossible. I learned to travel by compass and at the onset of darkness to find my way back to the battalion with mutual light signals. The reconnaissance trips into the desert held a great fascination for me. In the weeks that followed, things remained fairly quiet. Individual British patrols put out feelers to the south. But they were intercepted by our own wide-ranging patrols. In this, our fast eight-wheelers were particularly valuable. By the beginning of May 1942, I felt myself integrated. I had visited and gotten to know all the companies and had been out with several patrols. I had grown accustomed to the rhythm of daily life. We used to drink half a litre of fluids in the morning, nothing during the day, then the second half, in the evening. Supplies came up every few days, Yashuli in convoy, to avoid being intercepted by the British. One even got, you said, to the cold nights. We didn't take off our tropical coats, and thick, non-regulation scarves, until well into the morning when the heat had slowly worked through them. This was the thermos principle which we had learned by observing the Bedouins. But the millions of flies were a real torment. Only when one got deeper into the desert did their number diminish. The heat during the day gradually became unbearable. Everyone sought out a little patch of shade. Some men really did fry eggs on the overheated armour plating of the tanks. It was no fairy tale. I have done it myself. The peak period for the massive downpours of rain was over. But when it did rain, the little wadis were filled in minutes with three-foot-deep flash floods that carried all before them. I once saw how the truck with our field kitchen, which had failed to get out of the wadi fast enough, was swept along some hundreds of yards by such a wave. On our reconnaissance trips, we sometimes came upon a Bedouin family. 
Only the Bedouins knew where to dig in order to reach the underground Sweetwater Lake. In some wadi or other, they would dig out a water hole, guide the water along hastily dug channels, plant their millet and stay until they could reap the harvest. The corn would be loaded onto camels, the water hole filled in, and a day later, every trace would be gone. The Italians managed to locate a few of these water holes, construct wells, and so use them as vital supply points. Bir Hachaim was one such water hole. I once managed to make contact with a Bedouin family. They seemed to be on the point of departure. The women ran into the tents at once when we approached. No stranger was permitted to see them. The family sheikh came up to us. We indicated that we were German. We didn't want to disturb you, still less drive you away. We regret that we are causing you inconvenience here in your ancestral lands. Aren't you afraid of the war, of the mines, and so on? In a gibberish mixture of German, Italian, and a few scraps of Arabic, I tried to make myself understood. We always know where you are and move away whenever things get dangerous, replied the sheikh. We have many places where we can find water and cultivate our millet. We are glad to greet you as Germans. We don't like the Italians, who have occupied our country, any more than the British, who are oppressing our brothers in Egypt and the other Arab countries. One day, you will all have disappeared again, and the desert will belong to us again. Allah be with you. We like Yoko. It was strange that the Bedouins not only venerated Kaiser Wilhelm II and Bismarck, who were thought by many of them to be still alive, but approved of Hitler's campaign against the Jews because of their own antipathy. We avoided all talk with them about the Jewish question. Suddenly on 24th of May 1942, I had been in Africa now for seven weeks we were summoned to division. General von Bismarck briefed his commanders. Rommel has decided to attack. IME British are receiving fresh supplies every day. One can predict when they, themselves, will start an offensive. Our supplies are coming in too slowly and they are coming through the harbours of Tripoli and Benhazi instead of through Dema. This means that everything has to be brought up along the one coastal road, a distance of up to 2,000 kilometres. The British may know about our offensive and when it will start. It seems our reports and radio communications are being intercepted, but they don't know where the main thrust will come. Von Bismarck then gave us combat orders and stressed the fact that, by means of a vast night march, Rommel planned to move the whole of the Afrika Corps around the south of Bir Hachem and swing it north so as to cut off Tobruk and thrust eastward to the Egyptian border. A faint attack in the north on the Ghazala position was to deceive the British. My Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion, acting independently on the right wing, was to advance around Bir Hachim giving it a wide berth and block the coastal road east of Tobruk, as well as secure the right flank of the Africa Corps by means of patrols. We assembled during the night of 26-27 May 1942. It was pitch black. Only the stars of the clear southern sky were to be seen. The exact compass bearings were known to every vehicle. These had to be strictly observed so that the thousands of vehicles travelling through the dark night would not get mixed up. It was a ghostly scene. Each man could just see the vehicle to his front or side. We drove at reduced speed so as to avoid raising too much dust and thus lose contact with our neighbours. We pushed on slowly through the night. After a while, we knew we were south of Bir Hachem, though we couldn't see it. Far to the north, we saw the flashes of the Italian artillery fire. As we heard later, on the Ghazala front Rommel had sent captured British tanks and trucks fitted with old aircraft engines across the terrain to simulate a tank attack. The attack on the Ghazala position was mounted by Italian divisions under a German general. The British didn't seem to have spotted us. In the early morning of 27 May, my battalion, on the right wing of the 15th Panzer Division, turned north in the direction of Knightsbridge on the Trig Capuzzo, a track parallel to the Via Balbia, which we soon reached. We were in the best of spirits. The surprise appeared to have worked.
It was only a few kilometres to the Via Balbia, our objective. It looked as though the British in the Gazala position and in Tobruk were going to be encircled. Toward midday on 27 May, I suddenly saw a British tank column approaching from the east. They were new tanks that we had never seen before. Only later did we discover that the tank in question was the American Grant, a tank superior to our Panzer IV. Suddenly, some of the Grants turned south and opened fire on my advanced units from a range that was too great for our 5cc anti-tank guns. I stopped the advance at once and ordered the setting up of a defensive front to the north. To coordinate the use of our defensive weapons, I left my command tank and ran to the anti-tank guns. Shells were bursting all around. I suddenly felt a powerful blow to my right leg and fell at once to the ground. A shell had hit an armoured car and a piece of shrapnel had cut my upper right thigh. Blood welled out from my trousers. I lost consciousness for some seconds. A scout car came alongside, picked me up and took me a few hundred yards further back to our doctor. A bad wound. I was angry and in despair. Had my time in North Africa come to an end already? You are lucky in your bad luck, Major, said the doctor after his examination. You've got a hole the size of a fist in your right groin. Another few centimetres and you would have lost your manhood, but no vein or bones or nerves have been hit, which is just as well, as I would never have been able to apply a tourniquet on the spot. There's no question. You must go to the nearest field dressing station for treatment. That was easier said than done, for in the meantime, the Africa Corps had obviously encircled the British in the Gazala position, but it had not taken Tobruk. On the contrary, we ourselves were now encircled. To get out of the envelopment from the east was hardly to be thought of. With the help of morphine injections, I managed to resume command in my jeep. Captain Evert, in case I can do no more, you will take command. I'm trying to establish radio contact with Rommel to hear how things stand and what orders are being given. Thank goodness the connection with Rommel went through. The situation was extremely dangerous. At Knightsbridge, southwest of Tobruk, the attack by the Africa Corps had petered out under fire from the British artillery and the relays of attack by the Royal Air Force. So too had the frontal attack by the Italians in the north. I managed to set up a defensive front to the east. Luckily for us, the British attack from the east was directed more against the two panzer divisions of the Africa Corps. The British assumed that Rommel would try to break out to the east. That was the basis of their dispositions in the days that followed. Rommel now made one of his rash decisions. He ordered the Africa Corps to escape from the encirclement, not to the east, but to the west, through the minefields of the Gazala position. My orders were to guard against a breakthrough by the British from the east and prevent a possible outflanking movement in the south. For five days I sat in my jeep, still under morphine, until in the morning of 1st June Rommel succeeded with the help of the army engineers in clearing passages through the minefield and in releasing the whole of the Africa Corps from its encirclement, although many vehicles had to be abandoned for lack of fuel. We were the last to disengage from the enemy and reassemble behind the Italian lines. My wound did not look good. I can no longer take responsibility, said our doctor. You must now go to Derna as quickly as possible, to our casualty clearing station. I realised that I couldn't go on as I was, but hoped that in Derna they would soon get me fit for duty again. With heavy heart I handed over command to Eveth, and, close to tears with anger and disappointment, let myself be driven to Derna by good old Manthe and my faithful Beck. An examination by the Germans revealed to my dismay that the wound was not only severe, but that during the five days in the jeep and from the dust of a Ghibli storm, it had become infected. You must go to Germany at once. An Italian hospital ship is in harbour. It will take you to Europe tomorrow. That was the doctor's lapidary verdict. Deeply disappointed, I was carried on to the ship the next day. Adieu, Africa. But not for long. The ship was a large liner 
painted white and identified as a hospital ship by a large red cross. I heard later that the ship had been sunk on its way back to Africa, supposedly because it had taken on war material. I was put in a little cabin, and there I raged at my fate. The following morning we cast off for Sicily. As my wound was severe, I was one of the first to be taken to the operating theatre, which was run by an Italian surgeon and his team, who, as a nurse told me in a whisper, came from one of the best Italian clinics. The bandages were taken off, the pain grew worse, the more so as I had had no morphine since the day before. We can't have you becoming addicted, my doctor had said. The wound is not serious, thank goodness. We'll clean it up a bit first and go on from there. It was then decided to perform a small operation, and I was told that the limited anaesthetics were needed for very severe cases. Clench your teeth, please, I was instructed, short and sharp. While two sisters held me tight, the doctor, who seemed to me like a butcher, began to cut away at my wound. I cried out like an animal and thought I would faint with pain. Then I heard a voice. Please stop a moment. Beside me stood General von Weyers, commander of the 15th Panzer Division. What's up with you, Luck? Why are you shouting so? I explained the situation to him and asked him to insist on an anaesthetic. At his intervention, the doctors agreed so that the rest of the procedure was bearable. General von Weyers told me that he too had been wounded not far from me. General Gauss and Colonel Westphal of Rommel's staff had also been hit. The last he heard from Rommel was that the Africa Court, after its successful breakthrough to the West, was being marshalled anew to continue the offensive. After my wound had been treated, I sat with von Veers during the short crossing to the mainland. We discussed Rommel's chances of breaking through into Egypt despite inadequate supplies. In Naples, I was examined again and pronounced fit to travel. Next morning, an Italian hospital train bore me north. Although I couldn't stand, I still enjoyed the journey across the North Italian plain and over the Alps. The sun shone, the countryside looked peaceful, and there was nothing to show that Italy too was at war. Our treatment by the accompanying doctor and nurses was exemplary. After the hardships and battles in the desert, I was overtaken by a pleasant feeling of tranquility. At the Austrian border, we were transferred to a German hospital coach, which was coupled to an ordinary train, and we finally ended up in Esslingen, a small industrial town near Stuttgart. There were now only three of us, including a young reserve officer from my own battalion. The municipal infirmary, lying romantically in the hills on the outskirts of the town, had been declared a military hospital. Until we arrived, it had contained wounded from the Eastern Front only. So far, Esslingen had been largely spared by the war, apart from the fact that there, too, the inhabitants could subsist only by buying food stamps. In addition, there was nothing to be had any more. It was a good thing I had been able to provide myself with enough coffee and cigarettes before leaving North Africa, for these were more in demand than gold. I now made every effort to get back on my feet as quickly as possible, after a few weeks I was able to walk on crutches and then, cautiously, with a stick. My mother and sister came to see me from Flensburg. It was an onerous journey right through Germany, since the air raids were continually disrupting rail junctions or causing long delays. My uncle came also, from Stuttgart, and we enjoyed the warm sun on the terrace with real coffee and substitute cakes. North Africa seemed far away. All the same, I was glued to the radio every day to hear news from the theatre of war. We had in the hospital just two weeks when the special announcement came that Rommel had taken Tobruk on 21st of June 1942 and that South African General Klopper had surrendered the fortress. Nearly 30,000 prisoners had been captured and much war material had fallen into German hands, including considerable supplies of fuel which the Germans needed so urgently. This was followed by the announcement that Rommel had immediately turned east and crossed the Egyptian border on 23rd June. Rommel, at the age of 50, was made a field marshal. He commented to his wife that he wished Hitler had given him another division instead. 
We three Africans were naturally the cocks of the walk. When things looked bad on the Russian front, with the encirclement at Stalingrad beginning to loom, Rommel's exploits in North Africa at last offered people a ray of hope again. Nevertheless, they sensed very well that the war would last a long time yet and result in heavy losses. So Hitler and his propaganda minister Goebbels didn't fail to put an undue value on Rommel's exploits, even though they treated our theatre of war in the desert as of only secondary importance. After about three weeks, I had recovered sufficiently to be able to move about quite well with my stick. Bad Kissingen, my last garrison before the war, was not all that far away. I was able to persuade the medical superintendent to transfer me there until my recovery was complete. I wanted to recuperate in the neighbourhood of my old friends and in the atmosphere of the spa. So one Sunday morning I was taken by ambulance to a clinic that had been requisitioned for convalescent frontline soldiers. As it was Sunday, only one nurse was on duty. She put me in a nice room with a view of the park. I'll bring you some supper right away. I hope you'll be comfortable with us. The medical superintendent will see you in the morning. With these words, she left me to my fate. There was no telephone in the room. How was I to make contact with my friends? The clinic could not keep me. I found a broomstick and hobbled secretly out of the house to the Huber bar, only a few hundred yards away. When I entered the bar in my faded tropical uniform, it was still early in the evening and only a few customers were sitting. About Huber looked dumbfounded. No, it can't be. Our old friend Luck is here. My God, where have you sprung from? You've been wounded. Make room for our major there. Come to the table of honour. Sepp Huber and his wife could hardly regain their composure. They were so delighted. Here's my last bottle of whiskey, which I've kept all these years for a special occasion. We'll crack it now. The bar slowly filled, and before long, I was the centre of a large circle and had to give an account of myself. Everything seemed unreal to me. There I sat, as in the last year before the war, as though nothing had happened. Toward midnight, Huber closed the bar. Only a few customers were left. Then I suddenly realised with a shock that I didn't have a key to the clinic. What was to be done? Absence without leave, endangering recovery, etc. passed through my mind. You can stay with us, Major, said Huber. As an African veteran, you'll have no problems here in Kissingen. Then someone knocked on the door. Let me in, please, came a peremptory voice from outside. It was one of the spa doctors whom I used to know well and with whom I had spent many an evening at Huber's. I heard you were in Kissingen. Things soon get around here. I came over right away and am very glad to see that you are more or less all right. How long have you been here? What hospital are you in? I'm glad to see you too. Let's drink to that. I gave him the name of my clinic and pointing to my broomstick told him how I had got to Huber's. But I haven't got a key. That's the problem that's bothering me. My doctor friend slapped his thigh and burst into laughter. My dear friend, I'm the doctor in charge of the clinic. I must have turned pale, for he went on. That's all right. I've got my key on me. I'll take you there and tomorrow I'll see if I can get you a key of your own. Things could not have turned out better. July went by. I was well on the way to recovery. It was thought that I would be passed as completely fit for duty by the end of August or the beginning of September. Over the weeks, equipped now with a proper cane instead of the broom handle, I visited all my old friends. To my astonishment, the spa orchestra still played every day in the park. A peaceful world, if it were not for the daily bulletins from the Eastern Front and the reports of air raids on our city. I was determined to make the most of my enforced leisure and suppress the unpleasant things, as all frontline soldiers do whenever they have the chance. In the meantime, news came over the radio that Rommel had penetrated far into Egypt and had come to a halt near El Alamein, about 100 kilometres west of Alexandria. From telephone conversations with our replacement section near Berlin, 
and from what was said by men who had come back from Africa, I learned that shortage of supplies through logistical failure was the main cause. I could well imagine how angry Rommel would have been at so little understanding at the Führer's HQ and so little support from the Italians. During my time in Kissingen, I often went to my old barracks, where I met many wounded men from my old reconnaissance battalion 37, which had been in action on the Eastern Front. A number of my people had fallen and left behind family and friends in Kissingen. The battles in the winter of 1941, 42 and the rearguard actions had left the men washed out. No one believed any more in a quick finish. I was naturally envied for my posting to North Africa. Many ordinary soldiers asked me to give their regards to Rommel. Even the mayor and most of the functionaries, who were all members of Hitler's party, now saw things in a more sober light and wondered whether our march into Russia had not been a mistake. The propaganda tirades that Goebbels delivered regularly over the radio were insufferable. The talk was always of subhumans, the Lebensraum, living space, that was vital for Germany, and of faith in our beloved Führer. No one dared to express his doubts openly. The network of informers was too large and too dangerous. At the beginning of September 1942, I was pronounced fit for limited combat duty. I went to my mother's for a week and then to the replacement section near Berlin. There I met a number of officers and NCOs who had been severally wounded and were now employed as instructors for the replacement. I even found my faithful Mercedes standing in the garage, repaired and spick and span. I used it a few times to go to Berlin to visit friends. Berlin was suffering most from the air raids and from the stringency of the food situation. The faces of the Berliners, who were once so cheerful and quick-witted, had grown grey. With their sense of reality, they had no illusion. There was nothing more to keep me in Germany. I wanted to rejoin my unit. At the personnel office, I finally received my movement orders in the middle of September. I was to report to the German liaison office in Rome, and then fly to Tobruk via Sicily. Over the Alps to Rome I duly went, and from there straight on to Sicily. This time I flew in a vast Blom and Voss flying boat, which was used for transporting materiel. Again we flew low over the water. The British air bases on the island of Malta were not far away. It was fascinating to lift off from the sea and land on the water, leaving a huge cloud of spray behind us. From the air I saw the town of Tobruk and its harbour, which had been hotly contested and badly damaged. Then we were down, alighting by a sunken British freighter. Moments later, I was standing on the dock, breathing in the hot desert air that was so familiar to me. Now in September, it was even hotter by day than in the weeks when I was wounded. A car took me with my aluminum trunk to Rommel as HQ, which lay somewhere in the desert near Mersa Matui. We've had some hard but successful battles, Major, the driver told me. Now there's a lull on the Alamein front. Who will be the first to start things up again? I had no idea where my battalion lay, without doubt, deep in the desert. And then I was with Rommel. I reported my return fit for duty and congratulated him above all on his being made a field marshal and on his successful action. I'm glad you're here again, Rommel told me. Captain Evert has stood in for you very well and achieved great distinction with the battalion. For that I was able to present him with the Knight's Cross. Unfortunately, he too has caught one of these insidious tropical diseases. He's only waiting for your return to be posted back home. It's essential for me to have treatment too. You've come just in time to say goodbye to me. I'll be back as soon as I can. Best of luck and have yourself briefed by Gorse, Chief of Staff. I took my leave and went to General Gauss for briefing. It's good that you're here, Luck. We were beginning to think you might not be able to come back. Gauss, too, looked tired and emaciated. It had been particularly hard for him to make the right decisions when Rommel was leading from the front and out of reach, often for days on end. He put me briefly in the picture, especially about the thrust into Egypt, which for lack of fuel and supplies had come to a halt at Alamein only 100 kilometres from Alexandria. 
He told me of Rommel's deep disappointment over the slack conduct of the war by the high command of the Wehrmacht, meaning Hitler, and over the half-hearted efforts of the Italians to ensure adequate supplies. The field marshal struck me just now as disappointed and depressed, I interdicted. Is that to do with his health, or also with what was probably the last unsuccessful attack on Cairo at the end of August? I wasn't able to hear much about that in Germany. With both, replied Goetz. His state of health really is a cause for concern. Rommel needs rest and quiet. But you know what he's like. He won't leave his theatre of war, especially not in the decisive phase that's coming. Then, to add to it, came the profound disappointment over the offensive at the end of August. Our rank and file, with their gallows humour, called it the six-day race, after the popular six-day bicycle race in the Berlin Stadium. We knew that Monty, General Bernard Montgomery, was preparing a decisive offensive, Gauss continued, but wouldn't start it until he had received all the material he needed for complete success. Rommel hoped to forestall him with an offensive of his own and be able to turn the tables on him yet again. The last chance was at the end of August, at full moon. Marshal Cavallero had promised him that several tankers would arrive before then, and Kesselring had promised 500 tonnes of fuel a day by airlift. On 31st August, the fuel was still not there. Now, Rommel had to start. Severe sandstorms prevented the superior RAF from being used. Our own Messerschmitt fighters stood on the airfields with no fuel. On 2nd September, a mere 900 tonnes of fuel arrived out of the 5,000 announced. 2,600 tonnes had been sunk. 1,500 were still in Italy. Next morning, the storm had subsided. Now, almost in flyover formation, RAF launched wave after wave against the Africa Corps, which was thrusting north behind the Alamein position. A British division, which up to then had not been spotted, had occupied a range of hills with a front to the south. The two, together, brought the attack to a standstill. Because of the missing supplies and the almost 100% air superiority, the attack came to nothing. The reconnaissance group, which included your own battalion, had been sent east at the very beginning in order to march at once on Cairo, about 100 kilometres further east, as soon as the Afrika Corps had reached the coast behind the British. The group was hit particularly badly by the air attacks and suffered heavy losses. In the night of 2 to 3 September, Rommel decided with a heavy heart to break off the attack and withdraw from the rear of the British position. On this retreat, Brigadier Clifton of the New Zealand Division was taken prisoner and brought to Rommel. His fate was remarkable. Whenever possible, Gauls went on, Rommel likes to talk to prominent opponents. So too with Clifton, to whom he first expressed his admiration for the fight his division had put up. He did complain, however, about the atrocities that had been carried out on German prisoners. That's the Maoris, Clifton replied. Original inhabitants of New Zealand who fight as ferociously as the Sikhs from India. I deplore it. Clifton had fought against us in 1940 in France and said now that they were sure of victory in the end. Inwardly, Rommel too was already convinced of this. Shortly after, Clifton escaped through a lavatory and was picked up alone in the desert with only a water bottle in his hand. Rommel couldn't meet his request to be sent into German captivity and not to the Italians. Rommel regretted that all prisoners in North Africa, at Mussolini's wish, had to be handed over to the Italians. It became known later that Clifton, after making eight vain attempts to escape, managed to get to Switzerland on the 9th, despite being wounded. During his conversation with Clifton, Rommel mentioned that the Allies, too, would have to get used to the idea that the danger in the future would come from the East, from Russia. So luck. Now you know why Rommel is so disappointed. Weeks after Rommel's unsuccessful offensive, the rumour was still going around that an Italian general had betrayed Rommel's plan to the British.